PhD.org? Yeah, that guy. If I've, if I've offended you by reviewing a man page or something, I'm sorry. Uh, it was not intentional. Should we go around and have everybody introduce themselves, or should we skip that? I don't see anybody really wanting to introduce themselves. <laughs> Let's skip that for now. And if you like, if you have a question or something, maybe the first time you ask, say who you are and what your affiliation is, or don't. It's up to you. Uh, incidentally, this is Idaho near Coeur d'Alene from about two weeks ago. Uh, the right side of the image is cut off. I don't think it's going to cut off any of the words on the slides, but we'll see. And let me start by saying thank you for everybody who came here. It's a much larger group than I expected, and it's, it's gratifying to see that interest. Uh, we, the documentation is a huge, critical, important part of FreeBSD, and we appreciate the people who work on it. We have a few large items on the agenda that I want to talk about here, and some will, some have a few slides and will take a little while, and some have one or two slides and will take a longer while. The first thing is this translation issue. Uh, last year at BSD CAN, Benedict said something that I thought was so, so simple and yet so profound that it still got me thinking about it today. And that was, if it was easy, somebody would have already done it. And the, the trick in the, the subtlety of that saying is, Easy doesn't necessarily mean technically easy. Something can be technically easy but require a lot of time. Or it could be technically difficult. Or it could be something that's technically easy but painfully difficult in terms of commitment to do. Something that's just really unpleasant. And the context when we talked about this last year was the translation project and the way our system is uses translations and generates translations. And we would like to switch to a newer system that can handle the volume of documents we have with FreeBSD and allow people who want to translate but don't have the necessary background knowledge at this time of DocBook XML and make files and XSLT to contribute their, their help in translating. All right, so what we talked about last year at the event was the translation system that is used by, I'll say, most other open source projects. And this is a quick overview of how that works. It's based on get text or PO files or POT files. It's all the same thing. And the way that works is translatable strings are extracted from a document. The source document is usually DocBook XML. There are some others that can be handled this way. Uh, a special editor is then used to enter translations of those strings. You see the, the original English string in the top, we'll say, and you enter the translated string in the bottom. And then once that's complete, or once you've entered all the translations you can do, uh, the same utility is used to replace those strings in the original document and generate a new XML file where all the strings have been translated. And let's say that's German, for example. So now you have a new copy of the handbook XML file in German, and you can run the standard doc documentation build tools on it and get HTML or DocBook or whatever. And again, this is a standard process. Many other sites use it. Uh, many other large open source projects use it. It has some disadvantages. I, I want to make that clear, because uh, obviously we'd like the best we can get, but we don't want to choose something that's not in wide use because we could end up sort of isolated by that. We want to stay with the herd and take advantage of the technology that's been developed to use that. Uh, one of the disadvantages for this is that the translation editor may not show you context. You might just see, here's a sentence, enter the translation of it below. And that could be a problem because things mean different things in context. As I've, an example I gave last night is uh, there was a, a news article about a man, in, a man in Britain who found a bullet floating in his beer. This was just a couple of weeks ago. And he was so disgusted that he spit it out. What? Well, bullets don't float. <laughs> and somehow it had crawled into his beer. Well, it turns out that was a translation error. The original article had said a slug 
as in like a snail without a shell. But in English, a slug and a bullet can be the same thing. And so without context like that, it's, that kind of mistake can happen. If you're lucky, it's just something silly like that. Okay, what I'm proposing is a very minimal translation project just to get us started because at present, our system of XML files does not work with these translation tools. We have custom XML tags, we have huh, XML catalogs, XSLT, a whole bunch of things. What I would like to do is get a minimal project sort of as a starter so we can learn what the difficulties are of doing it in, in more detail. And there are two ports. There's a, a laser pointer here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, TextProc PO4A is one of those tools that can extract strings from uh, a, a source document and then replace the translated strings back afterwards. So is TextProc ITS tool is how I've always said that, but maybe it's supposed to be said its tool. Either of those has some advantages. Uh, PO4A is from Debian, and I believe it's somewhat dated. And ITS tool is from GNOME, and I know the guy who maintains it, although he doesn't talk about it when I ask him questions. I don't really know what's going on there. Uh, but it's newer and should be more standards compliant. In this case, either of those could be used, and as a, a technology test, it really doesn't matter which. Uh, and the proposal is to add make targets to our documentation tool chain to create this PO file. That's the file that contains the original English strings and then the translated strings. And then add another make target to take those strings from that file and generate your new translated uh, XML document. Stop me if I'm going too fast or say something if I'm going too slow. There are some other ports needed, and last night we had some work done on one that needed it. Uh, TextProc Poodle is a, essentially one of these PO editors that runs as a web service. So your translators go to a website. They don't run the editor locally. They go to a website, they see the strings that still need to be translated, and they enter them there. So it's kind of convenient for that purpose. And the other advantage we have with using this process, the PO files, is there is a commercial service called transifex.com, I believe it is. And they handle, it's kind of a version of Poodle, uh, only more involved. They handle those translations for open source projects. It's free to use. However, the, they take your document, they translate it, and give it back to you. I don't know that they give you the PO files or the benefit of <laughs> having the so-called translation memory, the uh, phrases or sentences that you've translated before are remembered. And I think that they are just building up their memory of that, but they do not share that with the free users. However, if we have this minimal starter project, uh, that would be the use of that or the use of Poodle or PO Edit or any of the other PO editors would be up to the individual translation teams, and they could each do it the way that works best for them. Uh, there are more than one. The PO editor is the editor that lets you translate strings. PO edit is the standard one, but there are more than one out there. There are some written in Java. <laughs> uh, write it in Java, run it anywhere except there. And one of those that showed some promise is, I believe that's Afrikaans, Vertal, whatever. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing it right in any case, but some of those other PO editors might show context, or they might have features we could use. Some of them will do things like, uh, okay, this, this string needs translation, and it will automatically do a Google Translate on it, which is not good enough for a real translation, but might help the translator see what that string is trying to say. So there may be other software that's needed for this, uh, but it's a starting point. Oh, okay. Anyway, and the proposal for this is, if it was easy, somebody would have already done it, so it's not easy for whatever reason. Uh, and it's difficult to 
uh, motivate people to work on stuff that is unpleasant or difficult unless they're a hobbyist and we are a volunteer group so I'm I don't want to blame any money anybody there is no blame to be had for this but we need this as a project so my proposal is we ask the foundation to fund the minimal project to get that started and unless somebody volunteers before then but it's unlikely for that to happen we are desperately in need of standardized translation because uh, we've had recently we've had translators stop translating because they couldn't keep up with the volume of changes we've had uh, translations that occurred originally years ago and haven't been updated because the workflow was just so difficult that people couldn't keep up with it we don't have a current Spanish translation uh, I believe the uh, the Dutch translation they said no we can't keep up with these changes and for them it's not as big an issue because they say pretty much everybody who speaks Dutch also speaks English so it depends on the language but we should have current translations of world languages and one thing that was pointed out at a seminar that Drew and I went to a couple of years ago by the guy who wrote ITS tool is that many times your first exposure the first exposure of say a software project in a country is by the translators they are the first ones using it because they already speak their language and English so they start using it in English and they say wouldn't it be great if I could use this for my company if only we had a translation and just to go to that point um, we don't have any translations of the man pages except there is a Japanese project that has translated some of them uh, good for them but we need more and I would really like to see our major feature is man pages that's a that's a huge benefit and PO4A, the, the Debian project, it has a way of extracting strings from man pages and letting you use this workflow. How well it works, I don't know. I've got to mention on Twitter, Tomato service called Convitex, which is an online uh, translation service. Right. Which is also open to and free for open source projects. That's correct. So it's using a REST API and whatever. Right. And that's the, it's, it's a f uh, free to use for open source projects. It's kind of a commercial version of Poodle, where it's a web based service uh, that users, they would need an account there, but everybody needs an account to go to any web page. But that's all they need. They have no other overhead. They, uh, and I haven't used it. I don't know if you sub can submit just an XML file. I would doubt that you can because ours are custom XML. I think you'd need to submit a PO file. And so you'd still need this. But that is a, a possible option for people to use. Yeah. The one remark, as you mentioned, translating manual pages, um, you now have in FreeBSD current, you used the Mandoc tool for formatting manual pages by default. And the current status is that in that is that for, say, formatting a Japanese man page, you don't need any option, so you can call the formatting tool in exactly the same way on a Japanese like on an English man page, provided it's uh, the source is UTF-8, and you will get UTF-8 output without any um, options. The only thing that would need to be added in Mandoc is support for finding the right directories. But that is relatively easy, so that could be done if you if you find the manpower to go that way. The uh, FreeBSD documentation project primer, or the primer as I call it, has what the original documentation product project was set up by some very smart people that still amazes me and at the, to this day, there is a hierarchy defined for translated man pages. We just don't have any of them in there. But there, that thought was already present, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. Well, man page is slightly more difficult to handle because there's a way to format the terms. Right. And, it, uh, it's not. Every sentence is broken up into several uh, lines because of the, the markings. 
Well, and that PO4A, the, it's supposedly, the 4A means for anything. So it's supposed to handle several different types of source documents and yet still be able to extract the strings. It's probably a mixed bag, but maybe it's usable. And maybe there are other ways to leverage this. It's also possible that if we can get our translation more accessible, uh, we will have more people interested in doing it, maybe just manually even. Uh, we did have somebody offer on the mailing list every so often. We have someone offer to translate, like Spanish or some other language that we should have a translation for. And we say, OK, well, read the, the FDV primer. It's a dozen chapters or so. You'll need to know about DocBook XML and our build system. And it's, we are essentially refusing that free technical help that people are offering us. And that's just criminal. There's, that's a shame. We shouldn't be doing that. We should have a way to take advantage of that free, free help that interested people are trying to contribute to FreeBSD. And this will let us do that. It separates the content from the markup because the translators shouldn't need to worry about the markup. They should worry about translating the sentence. Now, like all software, there's always a catch, and there will be fine details that need to be worked out. But we need to get to that before we can see uh, those. Right. Well, yeah, let me, let me be fair about that is man pages are a blue sky type of thing for me. I would really like to see that. But first, I would really like to get more translators working on our existing documentation. Because we really, uh, we really need that. There's this sort of project, like so many others, it started out people were doing manual translations. They, uh, Benedict can tell you how, about this. They, they watch the diffs that are what changes in the original English version, and they track that, and then they change it in the translated version. The original English we are not allowed to make white space only or mixed white space and content changes, so it makes it more difficult. Uh, we've had that. I found that very confusing because what exactly is a white space only change or a mixed change, and explaining it to new people is difficult. Sorry. Oh, we have we have a policy on that. So that at least there's a clear answer, which is. Unless the document was originally written with British spelling, use U.S. spelling. But the, the things like uh, the process we've, we did use and still continue to use somewhat for translation just can't keep up with the amount of documentation and the amount of changes we have now, much less the amount we would like to have. So we need to do this, I suggest. And that's my proposal. And I think we have at least three people from the foundation here, or four. And I propose that since, since this has been going on for at least several years, Benedict and I have, have worked on it and tried to motivate people to do it. And I suggest because of that, it is difficult. And probably we need to find a way to pay somebody to do it. So unless. Unless there are any other alternative proposals or better ways to do it, uh, this is what I will work on submitting to the foundation. Can we, uh, can we see the example of the output of the uh, type of build or PO for a? Uh, I don't have that to show you, but they're just uh, they're command line uh, arguments. And ITS tool, uh, for instance, it complained about our entities. We have entities for like trademarks like Intel. And I talked to Sean, the guy who wrote that, and said, do you have an option to where it could pass through these entities? Because translators probably will want to leave those in the translated version. And he did. And it's still, something is still not right. And it involves all our XML catalogs. And so I do have some notes on that. But I, I don't have them on slides here because I didn't want to spend that much time on it. Uh, I I almost agree that uh, uh, that it is a good good idea to have uh, this kind of a translation, uh, this kind of a transformation from the original English document to 
Right. So, uh, if we uh, adopt uh, this kind of uh, trans, uh, this kind of transformation for a translation work, we can have uh, uh, XML markup for layout only, and uh, uh, we can separate uh, the content from the uh, uh, current uh, a bunch of XML files to uh, small pieces of XML files which contains uh, only uh, content, only so small uh, tab set, uh, so that the uh, IPS tab set can be used for this purpose. So English document and uh, the layout part is common for uh, all of the languages. And uh, we can, uh, uh, what we need for a translation work, it will be the uh, looking <coughs> into uh, uh, this content part probably we have such a, a content only XML file in a repository in the uh, As far as I know, that's kind of how the PO file works, but uh, for both XML, man pages again are something that we haven't even looked at. And I think, I think when I mentioned it to Benedict, he kind of said, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's something like that. But uh, that, once we have a starter project like this that can deal with just XML files, I suspect we'll find that there will need to be some post-processing or editing of the generated XML file with the translations in it. And I hope to automate as much of that as possible because the hope is that translators would not need to worry about the markup. I don't think that will happen in, in practice but maybe we'll get it to where they only need to worry about a little bit of the markup in the translated strings. And man pages hopefully would be a follow-on to that. So yes, at this point we can't even answer the questions about that because we have not yet successfully extracted the strings from non-trivial documents. We've done it with trivial test ones, but the handbook is certainly not, non, not trivial. So. After we do this, we will have a better idea of what will be needed. So the nice thing with the PO Vitex approach is that over time you're building a database of already translated strings. So when you're um, translating a new document, you already get suggestions for already translated strings that you can take from that translation memory database within there. So it's right. Well, and that will depend on how many people. The nice thing about Poodle being a website is that translation memory is shared by all the people who use it. So if there are, say, four people committing, or not committing, entering German translations, someone might log in and, and find that, OK, this sentence needs to be translated. Oh, but somebody already translated it in a different place, and it's already done, so I'll just accept the one that's in there. And that translation memory, as it's called, keeps growing as you keep using it. The more people there are committing or entering translations, the better it gets. Now, some of that will not be as good as it sounds, because if you have a, a, a long sentence, it's unlikely to occur more than once in the, in the handbook, say. And if it did, that would probably be a mistake, because a long sentence should not be repeated this verbatim anywhere. Entities, the entities would be the same. Yeah. So, well, maybe, uh, Chris or Drew can tell us how 
Oh, yes. Yes, see, you uses Poodle already, right? PCBSD uses Poodle. They have a Poodle website, which is very nice to look at. It shows percent translated. So if you had, say, the document to be translated, and there was, you can tell how close to complete it is. Uh, but I believe you don't use it for XML. Is that right? Well, we don't have anything that uses XML. OK. Because that would be really easy, and so, we would have been all over that. But they may already have. They have so many conversion tools in there to go from different formats and languages. There is. The, the one difficulty we have is we use DocBook 5, mm -hmm. uh, which is XML, of course. But it has some additional tags that we've added, like for revision number. Uh, and there are a few others. And then we use XML catalogs, and it's a whole XML. I don't want to say XML is after my time, but I've not used XML extensively. And most people have not used XML extensively. They've used a little of it, and it's so simple until you dig below, and then it's like a recursive protocol that's full of exceptions and ugliness. Uh, so it's one of those things where the difficulty factor might be just the hassle of figuring out the minimal working configuration to extract those strings. And once you've got that, it's a jumping point, and you're, the rest of it is just downhill. So I'd say focus on take their existing XML conversion. It's all Python. Just hack it up a little bit, throw it in, accept your XML as a special tag, and then hopefully you're, you're able then to start using the rest of the tool properly. Uh, the ITS tool is in Python, too. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing we want to do. And once we've got a, a minimal working configuration, all it has to do is generate these PO files and be able to generate the completed translated file. From that, you get the options of going different PO editors, Poodle, well, we, uh, uh, TransFX. All, all the same thing. We went, with, uh, we went with Poodle because we looked at all these offline editors, and we wanted to set the bar to entry as low as possible. Right. right. It's, it's excellent. You go there, it says you look up the language you're interested in translating. It says this translation is, say, 40% complete. Here's a list of the strings that need to be translated. But, uh, so the, uh, the new versions of Poodle also have a feature where you can download the PO file and use your offline editor if you have some fancy utility you want to use and then upload it again when you're done. So it, you don't lose that functionality by going to Poodle. Right. Well, and also we want to avoid the situation of telling people what editor they have to use. Because that's not going to go over well. So, OK, everybody's going to use VI now. <laughs> Emacs. No, no, I meant Emacs. Yeah, VI is fine. No, that. <laughs> I don't think that would go over well. But yes, Poodle is, the nice thing about Poodle is it's open source. It's free. Uh, we could control it ourselves. And that translation memory, which could be valuable to us, we have control over. TransFX, if you use their system, they have a lot of users, a lot of people doing translations. It's free. But you don't keep those that translation memory. And that it, it might pay for an individual language to use that, but I don't know about the whole thing. So the thing about Poodle we found is it's, you mainly just need a couple of good script folks to do all the automation of getting your strings out into Poodle and then reversing it and getting the strings back into the project. Once those are there, Poodle handles pretty much everything on its own. Um, we've been working on it this week. We've been trying to get it hand, the handbook. The, the PCBSD handbook. Yes. Yes. OK, well, <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. But as I say, the majority of the work on the back end is just a bunch of shell scripts with the cron job saying every night things are stuff to Poodle and then pull it back out. We have a git commit even, so it commits it to git when it's done so our strings can stay in somewhere. That's excellent. So, that's what we want. Yeah, that's what. Only for XML and maybe man pages, maybe some other stuff. Problem though right now that we're 
tried to sort out regardless of how we engage the set of the tools, because we, we, we connect with the very same thing. The translators who have come to us are non-technical, uh, absolutely. Uh, and we've been trying to teach some of them Git. Yes. So the uh, but the bigger problem that we're, we're trying to figure out how to cleanly formalize is not just what happens in these tools, but how to track what happens in these tools. We, we kind of are figuring that whatever goes into Brutal or whatever would go into a third party tool, the magic of any of the history of the changes in there is going to stay in there. And then what comes into the actual uh, source tree is something different. So we're looking at how to organize the crossover points. How do we, with minimal human effort, actually validate what's coming in the door? And, and, uh, and how do we formalize that in terms of the way that we actually make commits to the, the source tree? Uh, so I'm, I'm actually curious about how you guys so are doing it and how. We set there a separate Git repo just for PO files that has a source tree. So if our Poodle server dies or gets wiped tomorrow, I can still recover all the translations and the history of what was done and, and tweak it that way. So okay. we will do the same as before. And then you guys have committers who are pushing into? Nope, it's automated. Every night um, it'll commit all the strings, so then we can go back and say, ooh, we need to roll these back or if we're going to use this problem. Never really had that happen, but the functionality is available to that too. Yeah. Thank you. You mean a, a problem with the, the quality of the translation or a technical well, problem? In terms of quality of the problem, the translation, or a technical it hasn't happened yet, but should the need arise, I can always go through Git history and see who I want to revert back to this known good quantity here. System administrators don't trust anything, software or human, right? Yeah, no. Uh, no. There, there is another issue that some of these PO editors, the shared ones, handle, which is, uh, and you were talking about non-technical users doing translations, that can be a bad thing. I mean, if the non-technical user does not really understand what they're translating, some of the PO editors, the shared ones, uh, will uh, show several translations. If there's more than one for a particular string, it shows you all of those. And some will let you vote on which is the better translation. And some will let the, the translator pick and choose from those which they want to use. And it's the same. It has a suggestion. So you know, right. market is officially committed. You suggest the translation. Then somebody with a better grasp of the language later can look at it and say, ooh, I accept that one. That's good. Right. And that gives you some sort of quality control if you have enough people in translating for that particular language. I would start one thing that was very different from uh, and the tools that I've found reflected. Our objectives are not right now at all documentation translation. Our objectives are the entire user, user interface yeah, yeah. for OpenSense. Right? So uh, with that, uh, we are less strict and less uh, right. Right, that was the original use for get text was the, the strings in user interfaces, open, close, save, whatever. But remember the slug and the bullet. So <laughs> even, even single word stuff or short user interface stuff is easier to translate than continuous text like the handbook. But you still have that issue of assuring that the translation is actually correct in context. So. Uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem I wish we had. Let's put it that way. I wish we had so many translations that were not quite right that we could pick and choose. Uh, let's get there. Should we, anybody else have comments they want to make on this before we move on to another topic? So what are the next steps you're following? I want to talk to the foundation people and say, let's propose a project for this. We need to find somebody who can do it technically, which, like I say, uh, if it was easy, somebody would have already done it. So it's much like, I think of like the Xorg project, where it's difficult to find that confluence of skill and time and free BSD knowledge and willingness to do it. Uh, and that's why I think we need to offer to pay somebody for that. Certainly, the project needs it. So I don't, I don't see any difficulty justifying it. It's just we need to see uh, how much do, will it cost us to get somebody to do that. But before we do that, we need to find somebody who can do it technically. So, and I have no doubt there are those people. It's just uh, 
for example, Gabor did the, the DocBook 5 conversion, but he's busy working on some kind of degree, I, I think. Uh, and he might be interested in doing it. There's probably half a dozen people in this room who are interested in doing it and can do it technically, but may not have time to do it. It's like, well, I can work on your little documentation project or I can have a weekend with my kids. You know, So that, that goes back to that, if it was easy, somebody would, all, would have already done it. Let's make it easier for somebody to do it. OK. And I, the way I plan to do that is I plan to get with the, the foundation, say, what do we need to do to submit a proposal? Where can we announce it, like to the mailing, li mailing lists, and say, here's what it is, here's the offering price, here's what will need to be done. And maybe, I've had this happen to me before on FreeBSD, if you can get the word out to the right people, they just go ahead and do it. So that could happen also. That would break my heart, too. It would be terrible if somebody just went ahead and did this. OK. Any other comments on the translation deal thingy project? OK. I'll go back to where I was. The documentation tool chain, this, is, this will be a quick one. The documentation tool, ch tool chain involves make files, uh, shell scripts somewhere, I believe, XSLT, um, XML, uh, probably a whole paragraph of other things. We don't have anything in the primer that talks about how this all interrelates and works. We tell people how they can build the documents, assuming that all this is working. We don't tell them how to work on the XSLT stuff. We don't tell them anything about the XML catalogs or XML files. I would like to document that. But again, we have Gabor. We have like one or two people who can work on it, and they are busy. And we right now, for the last six or eight months, when you build the handbook, it gives a list of spurious errors about entities, I believe. Right. And they're not real errors, but they, they make the, the make lint function pretty much useless. And I've looked at it, and XSLT sounds like a whirlpool of suck, if you'll pardon my language. But, uh, I keep, as I've been telling people, I am not stupid. I shouldn't have to tell people that, and it's starting to worry me. <laughs> but getting a start in any of that, uh, it's like a book on learn how to program in Python. Well, Python is a program programming language, and it has variables and statements. I don't want that. I don't need that. I don't have six months to spend on that, and I've learned it from other languages. I need to know this of how XSLT is used in our document files. And so when I find a bug, which I have, I can reasonably hope to find where it's caused and maybe even fix it, at least find the location. But uh, we have that issue with other things, too. And we probably ought to find someone to do that tuning. Uh, it would help if our build process could go faster, because it takes a long time to build the, the handbook. It got a lot faster when I moved all the PGP keys out into a separate document. And then it got a lot slower when Alan moved the ZFS document into the handbook. So it was kind of a net even there, but it, it's very difficult to work on the handbook to test build it because it takes, depending on your computer, uh, a minute or more to build. And that's nonlinear, we found out, too. Uh, the more things that get in there, the longer and longer it takes geometrically. So anyway, this, is, this might be a second project. Uh, clean up and uh, do some improvements to the existing documentation tool chain, the XML one. And then I would like to get a, at least a small chapter in the primer that says, this is an overview of how it works, because we need that. Like I said, this is, the slides would be different. Some would be quick, and some would be, take longer. So any comments on this? If there's anyone who's interested on this, uh, send me an email wblock at freebsd.org, or send an email to the doc engineering, the D-O-C-E-N-G, at freebsd.org mailing list. OK. Hey, yes? There's also some bugs. Like, I updated my PGP and did an XML build. Sorry? I I, sorry, got to talk loud for the mic. I updated my PGP key and did an incremental rebuild and discovered that it was broken. I broke the build, but my incremental rebuild didn't rebuild that. It, 
it's like anything else. It's like the FreeBSD source build system. It needs continuous ongoing work because it grows and it's put under a lot of stress. <laughs> That's a good thing, really. That's what I call a happy problem. You want stuff that is so used that it's worn down to a nub. All right, so this is the bigger one. This is the big issue for this meeting. And I, like I say, I'm already encouraged by how many people are here because it's like I will be giving a talk tomorrow at 1030 on installers. And I'm giving that talk even if nobody shows. If there's, it's an empty room, which this one could have been, but it's not. So already we're doing well on this. We have three goals for documentation. We want it to be comprehensive. There should be a man page for every program, every function, everything, uh, every configuration file. We want it also to be current. And there we have a little bit of a problem. We have man pages that have not really been reviewed for years, some of them 12, 15 years, which is fine if they're correct. But you don't really know if they're correct if they haven't been reviewed. So, and likewise, we have uh, parts of the handbook are quite old and possibly fine, but they need to be reviewed. And when I say reviewed, I mean by a group of people. You can have an editor look through and see if the language is correct, but that does not tell if the uh, content is correct, if it's telling the, the, the reader the right way to configure something or use something. Is there a list somewhere that you maintained of missing man pages? I used to have some notes about that. I do not have one, but yeah, that would be good. Okay. There's the page on the wiki. Is it called, actually called the missing man pages. Oh, okay. okay. I'm not sure how it is. But I, how, <laughs> how current is the page on how current the pages well, are? The, the question of the wiki is something which offended the Oh, it's on here. Yeah, it's on my list. Uh, Well, the document date at the top, it doesn't, it only tells you when they were changed, but usually when you review a man page, <laughs> I shouldn't put it that way. When I review a man page, I review everything. And I blame this on Glenn, but because Glenn said to me, if you do something, do something in doc, do it right. Uh, only if there are changes. Uh, we could, the, you can put comments in a man page, so you could actually put that in the, uh, the FreeBSD copyright at the yeah. beginning of each one, well, except, for, except for the contributed, contributed stuff. Right. But when you added that comment, you would then update the date. The document <laughs> date? <laughs> well, the document date is supposed to be updated when you've made a non-trivial change. So if you've changed spacing or something, that right. doesn't need to be changed. And so technically, adding a comment could be seen as a non-content change because it's not content when somebody reads the man page. So yes, I, that's an excellent idea. Is somebody, does somebody have that on the uh, etherpad? Adding a marker tag, okay, uh, because I can't see it. That's a good idea. And we do also have an issue with a review date with the docbook XML files because those are generated by the subversion commit date. So if you look at the, load the handbook in your browser, what's the date that it changed? It's the date that handbook or book.xml was last edited. It is not the date of the last commit. So for many, many months, it's, it, it's months behind because book.xml is just the introductory part. It hardly ever changes. And that's misleading. Uh, I don't know how to change that, uh, a script that modifies that, or we pull it from somewhere else. But that should be the date that the handbook content anywhere was last changed. Because otherwise, it's misleading. It's like, hey, this is months out of date. How do I get the latest one? Can we just remove that for now? It has a little value in, you know, you can tell that it's not really old. But it, we need to do something different with it. I'm not sure what yet. Uh, it might be easier to just put, it, put the day it was built. Right. Which is or different. I, I would guess that. The I, uh, no, the handbook only on the web only gets built once a week. The handbook? Yes. Are you sure? Uh, my, my Isinga 
check on it alerts me many times every weekend that it's out of date. Uh, but anyway, yes. When I make a change, it's usually there within an hour. Yeah, it's not to be that's, incremental bills. Right. It's only a full bill once a week. The PDFs, sorry. The PDFs wow. are built once a week, sorry. Uh, but yes, it, could, it really should be the last date and time of the, the most recent subversion commit, really. And that could be found, I don't know if, su I'm sure subversion has some way to say, what's the last commit in this tree, yep. the date of the last commit. Or we could shell it, use a shell script for it and substitute right. it in there. The source tree does it for them, but it's unique. So it's, yes. It exists somewhere in our tree. Right, there's, there's a way to do it. It's, we need to do that because it's, it's uh, confusing the way it is. Okay, and the third thing here is quality. And Quality is a real sticking point because if we didn't care about quality, we could just, we could put all our docs on a wiki, anybody can edit it, put in whatever you think is right. We, in, in reality, we can't do that because that would let down the users, the readers. So we have to have some way to assure a certain level of quality. And maybe, maybe our current level is too high. I don't think so. But maybe that level is high enough to where it's uh, keeping people away from contributing. And there's, there's bound to be some sort of balance point there where the level of quality is not too high to, to turn people away, but is high enough to keep the inherent quality of the document. And so the trick is to get more participation because we need it without lowering the standards or lowering them too much. Uh, I still have this. And if somebody, for whatever reason, migrates away, there would be like a maintainer timeout. Yeah, so uh, I, that's. Would be the CFS chapter maintainer or right. You know, and I think in that case, maintainer might not be the right word. Because like or steward or something. Yeah, because of course it's, it means that if someone wants to make a change, this person has to approve it. And we don't mean that. We just mean if you're looking for the person who maintains this chapter, this is the case. Chief. Editor. Well, yes. Uh, we do have some strange. The overall number of changes. So if you have a document, you can make, basically make changes throughout the whole handbook. But once some, someone mm. just wants to maintain this one chapter, he doesn't have to like, have this whole commit list. Well, and there is an issue with uh, there are people who write chapters or sections of the handbook, and sometimes they put a credit on it. And then later, somebody else comes along and changes it. And yet, it still says on that credit, so-and-so wrote this. And yet, the parts that have been added or changed, they did not write. And that can be kind of weird because uh, the original author's intent might have been lost. And they might have a problem with that. And so there is a, an issue with that that would be easier if there was a known maintainer for each one. There are some sections of the handbook that do have comments that say, I, so and so, I maintained it, or I, I wrote this, or contact me if you have information on this, something like that. There are a few in there. Uh, they're just in XML yeah, just comments. They're not visible. But, but yes, I think that's an excellent idea. And that is one way. The problem with that is you need people who are willing to commit to maintaining a section, and how do you encourage them to do that? I suspect that uh, maintaining a section is really two jobs. One job is making sure that the content is correct, and I guess that should really be done by the person who is maintaining the related code, who is the maintainer of the, of the code, of the program. And the other job is more like what we said, editing, making sure that the markup is correct and the style is uniform and it's not too wordy so it's concise. And that should be that, from the documentation. That's an excellent point. However, uh, in, in the, the difficulty we've had with that is the DocBook XML tool chain, it, uh, 
There is a, uh, a misperception that documenting is sort of an afterthought and it's not that hard. And I would suggest that documentation is more difficult than programming because at least with a program you know when you're done. Uh, and so what has happened, uh, we've seen it in code reviews and email where a source committer says, oh, I need help with writing a man page for this. And it turns out to be not 10% after, after the 90% of writing the program. It's like they're 50-50. And that has put some people off. I mean, it's, they say, how can I write a chapter for this program? Well, in reality, usually the programmers do not say, I want to write a chapter for this. It's usually more like, would you write this chapter for it? But the, the tool chain kind of keeps them away from that. And with our DocBook stuff, I don't think there's any way to get around that. I think uh, if the programmer of a certain feature wants to do a document on it, that's great. And then they can get help from the documentation team. In reality, usually what happens is they say, I've got this program, and I'm busy. I do not have time to, to learn your 12 chapter, chapter FreeBSD primer uh, on documentation. So I need help with it. And if we have more participation, we have more documentation committers that can help with it. Right. Oh, go ahead. The way uh, we are getting involvement from developers is that we just encourage them to commit it in what markup quality ever. So they tell the, we tell the developers, just add the text you want to, uh, you want to add. If you don't know the tool chain and the markup, leave it out, commit it, and then um, people who know the documentation tool chain will see that commit, will get interested because it's from a developer they know, uh, knows the, the content, and will look at it and polish it. So as long as the tool chain isn't so complicated that you can't even check out the stuff, that should be solvable that way. Well, and we would have to have like a temporary area because uh, if you commit XML code that's incomplete, the document build breaks. And now we have, uh, we have automated systems now that tell us it's broken. And that, so we've, we've improved on that. But yes, uh, I don't think there's, it's ever going to be common for a programmer to be uh, a thorough expert at documentation at the same time. Usually, that's uncommon. But if we have more participation in our documentation team, we can have a pool of help available to the programmers. And in fact, from the source committers, we would probably get more people who would become documentation committers because they've been helped. So it all kind of works together. We need more people working on it. <coughs> Don't look at trough. And then I say, well, I don't have time to learn trough today. So you know what? I won't do it. And then, and then it's true that you know, doc, uh, the docs team says, well, if you just write text, you know, we'll help you with all that silly markup annoying stuff. But the point where I say, well, then I have to find somebody and then sync up and then get involved with an interaction there. Again, there's an activation <coughs> energy that stops me from even bothering. Where I suspect. If I could write the text that I want in ASCII doc, so I didn't feel so half-assed that it's like, you know, then I, I might actually do that. And, for, and it's different to go to somebody to say, I don't feel so bad going to somebody and say, I have something that's sort of almost right. Can you polish it? As opposed <coughs> to, I want you to do a whole bunch of work because I can't bother to learn trough. And we're like, ah, I should just learn the thing. But then I don't bother to see. Right. Well, and there is a there is a. Uh, I don't know what to call it, but there is a problem with learning something specific that you only use once in a while. I, I tell people, I paint my entire house every five years about, and when I start, I've forgotten everything I knew about how to do it right. And by the time I finish, I'm an expert, but I don't need it anymore. And so the next time it happens, the same thing happens. I'm an amateur at it again. And it's the same thing for the doc book markup or man page markup or any of that. Uh, unless you're using it all the time, it, it gets pushed out of your mind because there are other things that are more important. Whereas I don't suggest Markdown as a useful format, but I write Markdown 
every single day as I'm doing other little, you know, I'm embedding Markdown in Doxygen and other stuff that I do in my day job. Well, we did have uh, an example of that with Alan where he originally wrote the ZFS uh, chapter of the handbook, what became the ZFS chapter of the handbook. Uh, in I, Markdown. In Markdown, okay. And the problem with that was it doesn't map very well to DocBook. DocBook is semantic markup, right? You mark things based on what they are, not how they will appear. And ASCII doc, I've used that. I've used that on my website. Uh, some of you have seen my articles, wonkity.com, tilde w block, uh, slash docs. But anyway, I used ASCII doc for that. It is very much faster and easier to write things in than DocBook, but it's not semantic. I mean, you, you put quotes around a file name. That doesn't mean it's a file name. It just means it's supposed to be shown in italics. And DocBook gets away from that and separates the content from the, the, the rendering. So that was kind of a problem with that because I worked on Alan's stuff and it's like, well, yeah, this is marked up, but it's not, it doesn't uh, correspond well to the actual markup we use. If, it, if I was doing it again, I would say write it in plain ASCII. Don't use any markup. Uh, give me the sentences, use blank lines between, say, paragraphs or chapters or whatever, and then we'll add all the markup. And that is actually a little easier because uh, the markup then becomes the, the job of, we'll say, the editor. Uh, and then, of course, there's a feedback loop where it, it goes back to the original author and they say, oh, that's not what I, I didn't mean that to be a file name. That should be marked up like this. But it all kind of boils down to you have people who are experts in one area and you need a large pool of them to be available for experts in another area to interact with. Are there lightweight markup formats that include things like attributes where you could just put in kind of arbitrary attributes like that? Probably. <laughs> I'm trying to make it easier for you and you're trying to do more work. Yes, you want to do more markup. Well, so the, there's, there's making it easier, but then there's also either I have to go whole hog or else I have to do something that feels pretty half-assed. And I don't like doing half-assed things, right? Yeah. But those are issues. What you're really talking about is trying to find a common language between the two. Yeah. And that's difficult to do. Most of the time in human languages, they generate, uh, what do I want to call it, a, a pidgin language, P-I-D-G-I-N, which is sort of a simplified version of both. And Maybe there is something like that that works well, but is the overhead of having to learn a separate one to do that worth the time? I don't know. For, and probably the answer is, for some people, it is. Uh, for others, it's not. Well, and, and it like, uh, I recently helped uh, Marius Saborski do uh, updated man page for LibNG. He's adding all the right stuff. So he wrote in actual uh, MDoc or whatever. Uh, but Badly translated from the Polish in his head. And so I kind of called it up. And so I, I would have to ask him, because I'm not an expert on the web, is this function doing this or this based on what you wrote? And, and there, there is a lot of that. And I've, uh, non people who've learned English as a second or third or alternate language, they often have trouble with articles, a, and, the. Yes. And in English, those are really important because it. It, it identifies things, and I've noticed that's a problem for many people, and that's the kind of thing that the doc team can help with. The, the, the point really was that I wasn't an expert on the subject, so I couldn't have written the man page. Right. But, but the, well, and for a man page, you really need, you need a review of, is the language clear? Uh, and then you also need a review of, does it say what it's supposed to say technically? Because... And, and those are, uh, years ago I had somebody get mad at me because I knew computers, but I didn't know how to draw a tangent line in their drafting program. I never used it. You know, <laughs> it's, the, it's kind of the same thing. Um, there's a, uh, a man page on uh, UTF collation conversions or something that I reviewed, and somebody said, well, I need a technical review on this. Well, you got a technical review. What you need is a functional review. It's because I don't use this program. I can't tell you if what the man page says is factually correct. Maybe one additional remark, uh, remark on getting started with man pages, because I feel that some people were quite scared about it. Um, you don't really need to learn ROP. ROP, indeed, is a very 
very unusual language, not, not unusually complicated, but unusually unusual. You just need, for starting a modern web page, you just need the, the MDoc macro language. That language basically has 20 useful macros, all of which have a relatively easy definition. And if you just know two of them, so section header and new paragraph, you can already write something that you can commit and that formats readably, as opposed to XML, where if you do something wrong, it stops formatting. So whatever, uh, there is no more, since this January, no more way you could put anything into a man page that will stop the formatter from formatting it. Whatever you write, it will format. In head, in FreeBSD head. Right. Not in stable yet. There are, um, there are bound to be converters. Uh, and I should, aren't we supposed to take a break at 10? 10? 10 30. 10.30, okay. Uh, we should have put that into the primer. Uh, English well, and that, that was the point I was going to talk to is, uh, the primer mentions man pages. It says we have a hierarchy for translated manual pages. That's all it says about man pages. Our documentation project primer says not a word about writing a man page. And I want to fix that. I want to do a chapter. I, I'm trying to say want to rather than wanna. It, it just work with me here. And I'm trying to avoid saying yeah, because that's an informal thing. So I want to write a chapter that describes man pages, gives the reader a little introduction, and says this is the minimal required in a man page, uh, and maybe some formatting suggestions or something else, uh, an introduction. But the way most things work for documentation is if, unless you're familiar with the tools, the doc tags, the XML tags and all that, or the, the macros for MDoc, find a document that is similar to the one you're going to write. And this is, in, in practice, this is how it usually works. Find an existing man page, use that as a skeleton, a template for the one you're trying to write. The, the downside of that is you have to be lucky in the one you pick because the ones that are written recently have been checked with like mandoc-t lint, which checks for problems and tells you. And the ones that were written a long time ago uh, use a lot of things that we try and avoid now, like avoiding, avoid using the informal you. You need to do this. No, don't say that. This needs to be done. Uh, and they use messy formatting, and they put multiple sentences on a line. And so if you pick the wrong one, it's like picking the wrong parents. You don't know until too late. Well, it's also this sort of static versus dynamic analysis thing where I will only then see the macros that were used in that man page. And if there's right. another macro that I ought to be using all over the place in my library, then you know, I just will never see it. Uh, the MDoc man page, the old one is not bad. I mean, the one that's in stable. The new one I haven't even seen yet except last night when you showed it to me, so I haven't read it. But they do have uh, examples. They're not too bad. But given that and an existing man page, hopefully one that was written in the last few years, uh, it is possible to do that. And in fact, that's usually the way it works for DocBook also. People do not, s I'm going to write a chapter for the handbook. They don't sit down and start from scratch. They copy an existing chapter and see the tags and the way they're used in it. And hopefully, it's one of the more recent ones that has better quality formatting in it. But that is unfortunate. Well, true, but think of it as like uh, uh, Style 9. <laughs> You've read it, right? You have to. Uh, it's, it's not so much uh, a rule as for when there are questions, that's the document you go back to to find that. And like many of our documents, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, we, they don't get a lot of review because let's say you're an expert on X configuration. You remember reading that chapter in the handbook years ago. You've got the gist of it. You haven't needed it since. We need to get those people to go back and read it now to see if it's still correct. 
And the problem is, the more of an expert you become at something, the less likely you are to go back and read that. So a, a chapter on man pages in the, the primer, probably people will read that once and then not need it again, or not need it after an initial point. So it's a reference thing, an introduction thing, and then after that it probably would not be needed. So it, or it might be a quick refresher if you're, you've forgotten all that and you're, you've just completed a new program after six months and need to go back and get, get that going again. But yeah, in practice, yes, not yeah. Yes, in practice, many of our document files are copies, clones of existing ones. And that is another reason we need to review all the existing ones because we don't want bad examples in there to get copied. And for some reason, those are the ones people flock to. This is the absolute worst written man page you have. That's my template. Yeah, that's, that's also a problem with the ports and files. Is because exactly. Find something and it's like, well, about six years ago, that was the right way to do it. Right. And, uh, and it killed it. But it does exactly what I need. It does, exactly it does, what it does everything the wrong way, but so it works these, for me. All these, all these things that we think that we have stamped out three years ago suddenly you know, emerge. And uh, some of that. Explicit templates that say, here are two or three templates. This is a template for an application mm -hmm. for a library using whatever the current best practice of macro and whatever format. The, Actually, that, that is, is available. Yeah. In my last year's EuroBSD Conf talk, um, there are about 10 pages that say, start a library manual like this, start a utility library like this. The first six macros always need to be those. And also in the MDoc, in the new MDoc manual, you have about uh, five paragraphs about the very few things that catch you because they are wrong. That's 100 lines to read. And then you have one table. These are all the macros sorted by, by groups. So if you just read the first 150 lines of the, the manual and look at that, uh, at that talk, you have exactly what you are asking for. Uh, if I could copy and paste into an editor, here is, you know, insert look, name of your uh, editor, here, that'd be awesome. If you are on 10 stable, uh, the old version of the MDoc man page, it does have a template for a basic man page. It doesn't show, it doesn't show a lot of features that you might end up using eventually, but it does kind of give you a bare minimum as a start. And it, for me, it usually is easier to use one that I've already worked on, because it, it will have all the esoteric tags in there, like for tables and stuff, or um, uh, BL, whatever, uh, block, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Anyway, uh, the trivial ones are nice for getting a start, but if you're working on something like that, you, it's like a program. You quickly find you need more than just a minimal example. All right, anyway. Actually, uh, we, we do have uh, template man pages in uh, share examples and oh, right. oh, Excellent. Like well, and we need to make that more widely known. Yep. There's, I think my, my thousand line C shell RC init alias is in there somewhere as an example, which people see my shell completions and go, that's really cool. How did you do that? So I don't know. I put it in the example thing. Actually, that template is the same that is also copied into both the old and the new um, MDoc man page. So wherever you look, you always get that template. There may be slight differences, but these slight differences don't matter to a, to a new manual writer because, however, you, you shouldn't be so worried about doing it wrong in the detail because that can easily be caught by people reviewing the patch after it's committed. If you, do, if you do a commit to a program and break it and it crashes, that's bad. If you do it in manual and somebody cleans it up two days later, that's no problem. Well, and remember also now we have Fabricator, so it can be reviewed before it's committed. Yeah. And I, there is a man page review group. So far, I'm about the only one who's reviewing them. Some people have done others. And I know I've offended people by pointing out every possible mistake when that was not what they wanted. But again, uh, let's do it right. Because once it gets committed, it's more work to fix. Let's try and fi get everything fixed while we can. And it's easier before it's been committed. So I didn't know about And that's, that's what we call a discoverability problem. There are lots of things like that that we have, but nobody knows about it. 
In fact, the website, for example. Well, the nice thing about the primer is it is one, Place. one point of origin for all the documentation, in theory. I want to make it actually that. Let me move on to my next slide, which is still about participation. Uh, because we've got 20 minutes here before a break. All right, we need to encourage participation. We do have a number of doc committers. It was around 100, isn't it, last I looked? Who, people who, I don't want to say they actually commit things, but they have the permission, the commit bit. Uh, we don't have a lot of doc committers who close PRs. And that is not, I'm not saying they should be blamed for that. Closing doc PRs is generally not fun. Uh, some t there are a few PRs that are submitted that are okay, you know, if you're, if you're doing this just out of the kindness of your heart, the enjoyment you get out of it, somebody submits a doc PR that has a working patch in it that you can verify is correct in fact, uh, you can commit it. It's still a little bit of a hassle, but it's not terrible. But we often get these, oh, the description of such and such in the handbook is wrong. It's like, where in the handbook? How is it wrong? And so many doc PRs just don't get committed. There is no, the submitter never sees a response. Uh, it certainly never gets fixed. Uh, we need to have more people working on doc PRs, and I'm not sure how we do that because we can't put people to work they don't enjoy unless we're paying them for it, and I don't see any practical way we can pay people to commit doc PRs. What I would like to do is see a few people just say, oh yeah, I will, I will look through the doc PRs and if there's some I can work on, I will do them now. I will try and do maybe one or two a month or a year or a week. And that's something that as doc committers, we need to have a, some sort of uh, commitment to doing that more often. Or at least getting back to the originator of the PR because for them it's a black hole. We don't have an awful lot of open PRs for docs, but there are a lot, and it's growing all the time. And we need to take care of that because there's nothing more frustrating than having a PR that just sits there open for years. And I say years because I do have one PR. I think it's still open. It was 11 last time I looked. 11 years. It's probably not, not relevant anymore, but. Uh, From when I was Every once in a while, you get somebody new working on the bug, and it's like, well, let's just close all the ones that are more than a year old. It's like, well, go look at this one. This is actually still. And, and that's a lot of work to look at to look at a bug, to find what it's referring to, to figure out if it still applies. And it, it burns people out pretty quickly when they see this tremendous backlog. So one of the things that that people need to be shown on the PR system is show me PRs that are only so old. Because if you try to look at the, the entire mass of them and work from the beginning, you're just going to burn it. Yes. Well, and something, I don't know how we would implement it, but something that is very effective at motivating people for free is gamifying it, which is kind of a new internet speak term. Mm -hmm. But make a game out of it. Uh, have, a, have a leaderboard. So-and-so closed 10 PRs this week. Uh, the, the next one down is quickly moving up, and they may, you know, they're in a race. Stuff like that seems silly and stupid, but it's actually quite effective. Uh, and maybe we can do that somehow. Yes, there, there is a report out there that shows number of commits, uh, which I did a lot of white space fixes on documents where I would go through the entire 20,000 line thing and commit it. and that would register on that, which it's not really a, it, it was work, but it wasn't a, it wasn't like closing a PR. So, so yeah, maybe we can make a game out of it. Maybe we can challenge committers. Uh, maybe we can involve the foundation. Okay, you close 10 doc PRs, you get a hat. Why not? I mean, in, in the scheme of things, there is value in getting these PRs fixed. So they're worth something. <laughs> I have a hat like that. It's a, it's a lobster with claws. But uh, 
some kind of reward, and it doesn't even need to be a tangible reward. It can be uh, your name on the website or uh, we don't need no stinking badge. <laughs> Sorry, I, that, was, that was too easy. But something. Uh, and maybe have it a contest once a year. The person who has closed the most doc PRs gets a, 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 hat, a baseball hat with a shark sticking out of it or something. You know, it doesn't need to be uh, a monetary reward or anything like that. For example, BSD can a couple years ago, they called people up on the stage and it's like, these are our most valuable players for this year, uh, which I thought was extremely embarrassing to some of those people, but maybe that is a, a way to motivate people to do this, to work on this work, which to be honest is usually not that pleasant. If we can make it more fun, we'll get more participation with that. So, and the gamifying is a way of doing that. Maybe there are others. Uh, then source committers. We already talked about this some. How can we make it easier for them? Well, we've offered, uh, we've said, okay, if you're a source committer and you have a document that needs markup, work with us. We'll work with you. And in practice, that works sometime. Uh, you often have the difficulty of, sometimes when you write something, either a document or a program, it's your baby. And if somebody comes along as an editor and says, your baby has a funny haircut, <laughs> that sometimes does, is not accepted in the spirit in which it's intended. And that's also magnified somewhat working over the internet where people can't see your expression or hear the way you're saying it. Uh, so that's a problem. I know I've offended people by uh, reviewing their, their code, and I'm sorry for it. I, I, it was not intended, but I, I was not trying to offend them, and I wasn't able to avoid it. So it's tricky. Uh, I generally thank people and apologize a lot. Yes. Well, and that's another one of those problems where the people who are the most qualified to update it are the people who don't work with docs. I mean, they're, you know, the programmers and stuff. And really, we need to encourage the source committers to work with docs. I'm not saying learn docbook necessarily, but you should view a program, a program that, that's done but doesn't have a man page or documentation of some type, really only half done. And as an example, I will give an example of a program that I had trouble with and nearly abandoned, and now, yet now I use every day, our snapshot. Have you heard of that? A few. OK, our snapshot uses rsync and hard links to back up to make archival copies of hierarchies of files. And if none of the files have changed because it's using hard links, it doesn't take any additional space. So you end up with a, an archive of a history that is much like the Mac time machine uh, it's extremely useful, it's great to have, very little overhead, and the docs, I, I looked at it, and because I'm a person of the internet, like all of you, I have the, the attention span of a gnat, and because I couldn't find a quick setup thing that told me what I needed to know, I almost said that nah, I won't bother with this. Uh, and there are some other things, which we will talk about later here, where there's a similar thing. Uh, if the documentation is not there, your program is possibly not going to be used. And you need, well, I'll talk about that later. Everything should have, if it needs to be configured, you should have a minimal but complete working example. Don't tell them, oh, throw this into some file somewhere, this one line. Show the file because, well, we will show that. OK, now, one more thing I'll talk about, and then let's do a break. When we take on new doc committers, it should be made clear to them each time that we want them to mentor at least one new doc committer themselves sometime while they're working on FreeBSD. The idea being that the pool doesn't get smaller as people 
leave the project or have families or get lives or any of that kind of thing. So <laughs> mentor, <laughs> what? <laughs> Did I say something funny? Uh, so the idea is that when you become a doc committer, it should be with the understanding that you will at some point try to mentor at least one person to also become a doc committer. And that way our pool at least will not shrink. And we do really need it to grow. But I, there are things that we as mentors have not always made clear to people. And there are so many things to cover that that's understandable. But we need to keep this in mind. It's like, OK, you're a doc committer now. Guess what? <laughs> keep your eye out for likely candidates and become a mentor to them because we need more people. We need to encourage that interest. And uh, yesterday in the, uh, the vendor summit, Justin mentioned how com I think multiple companies had mentioned we're amazed at how literate the FreeBSD people are. I was jealous at the, the, the language used in that talk. It was, it made me feel <laughs> disappointed in my poor language. But yes, FreeBSD people tend to come from a very literate background. The original was from an academic background. And that's a, a rich place to get new committers from. Let's encourage that. And if you're scared about the whole mentoring process, then team up with someone. Right. There is no need that you have to do it all by yourself. And given the time commitments, it's better to have at least two because if a mentee sends an email at, in their time, they don't want to have to wait three weeks for you to get back from vacation. So if you have at least two mentors, it really does help. Yeah, the other problem uh, with solved by having multiple mentors is to make sure at least one of them is in the same time zone. Right. <laughs> or, or the same nationality, or has mentors usually don't have all the same areas of experience with docs even. So that can help also, because uh, like for example, if I want to know about the, uh, the documentation build system, or a man page, I can ask Glenn. If I want to know about XML and stuff. <laughs> uh, so yes, the, the, having multiple mentors is really kind of a neat way to do it. it, it being we need, and, and maybe this is even a more general thing about the PRs, think in terms of if somebody has a suggestion or a question, how quickly do they get feedback? And if the answer is six months, as it is with some of the PRs, they're not going to do anything. With an awful lot of doc PRs, it's never. Yeah, well, it's and yes, we all, need to work on PRs. that. Right, but. Doc PRs aren't as, as in bad shape as the source PRs. The ports PRs are a little better because we have this maintainer. The, the, ports, uh, the ports guys really have a lot going on correctly. They have the port manager thing where they do a report every so often. They have uh, an organization there that we really could use for docs. And I like that. We should uh, shamelessly copy their ideas. The, the thing is, we have a secretary to do, to do that, and he's there for only the report. Eh? <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> I mean, th there are good ideas that, uh, not that we haven't copied because they were not invented here. It's just because nobody has done it. And we can take advantage of that. So let's do. But if you're a doc committer, have you mentored somebody? If not, keep it in mind. If you're a new doc committer, also keep it in mind. And if you're not a doc committer, or a mentor, or a mentee, consider becoming one. Consider the many advantages. The recruiting grounds are the mailing lists. So when people post many, many uh, questions or, or help out other people, or FreeBSD forums, they have a very good uh, how-to section. That Well, and that's something we should point out. FreeBSD started out as a mailing list, uh, organized around mailing lists. And now we have the forums. I hated <laughs> forums for a long time. I was a Usenet user, and I loved it, and it worked great until Google took it over. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's all over now. The forums were not that good. Uh, it wasn't just the software, but the features of the features of a forum is not like a mailing list, where you can jump on it and just get new posts. Uh, however, that was years ago. And then I started using our forums in 2009. And you can set it up to where you connect to the forum. It shows you all the new posts since you were last there. It works like a news group. 
and we have very little overlap between the users that are on the FreeBSD forums and the mailing list users, which is a shame because there is good content on the forums which people don't realize. It tends to be user-oriented as opposed to, uh, say, programmer or technical-oriented, but we have a big overlap of those areas too. And so if you haven't tried the forums, check it out. There, is a, there are two buttons at the top of the screen after you log in that's mark all messages red and show new unread messages or show new posts. And if you use those, it kind of becomes like a mailing list to read. And there is valuable, useful information on there. So we encourage everybody to contribute there or to read there at least. And sometimes there is crossover from the other direction. But it seems like the forum users, I've, I aim them at the mailing list for technical usage sometimes. But uh, they don't like mailing lists a lot because it doesn't, it's not as easy to read. And you don't have the markup to show what is a file name and what is not. Or whether, uh, OK, this, here's a file name. Well, do I type the quotes? I don't know. But we do have markup in the forums that shows all that clearly. So anyway, all right. Let's uh, take a break here. And when are we supposed to start again? At 11? OK. So let's take a break till 11. <laughs>